Now that we've finished our calculations and we've looked at the various different types of calculations in terms of concentration, whether it be PPM or moles per litre or indeed percentage WV or WW or VV, I want to move into the fun part. OK, now this is normally where the fun begins in school, because when we're in school in the lab, we have the equipment in our hands and we can actually get a good tactile uh, experience with these pieces of equipment and we can put this together like a big chemical jigsaw, use the chemicals, get the results, wear the goggles. That's not going to happen this year, OK? Until we go back, obviously. Um, so we're going to have to try and make do with second best, which is online. So I'm going to try and guide you as best I can through the experience of titration, hopefully um, remembering to fill in everything that we need to know in terms of the glassware, how it's used, how it's treated, and then how it all comes together at the end in terms of a titration. So in cases of titrations, the reason why we do a titration, if you look at this picture here, is because we are looking at concentration of solution versus solution. So in other words, there will always be two solutions, solution A and solution B in a titration, okay? Obviously at this stage you understand that in order to do a titration, one of them has to be a standard solution. So in other words, the molarity of a standard solution has to be known. So we've got to know everything about one of them. And then the second solution, the molarity will be not known, okay? And it will be something we have to find. So therefore, the general thing is that we are going to have a certain volume of a certain concentration of solution B in my conical flask. And I'm going to have a certain volume of a certain molarity of solution A in my burette. And out of those four readings, concentration and volume of solution B, concentration and volume of solution A, one of them will be an unknown. OK, and if we know from the balanced equation that the two species react together in a ratio of one is to one, then it's very simple. You work out the number of moles of the known solution. You then work out the number of moles of the unknown solution by using your equation V1 M1 equals V2 M2 and the titration mystery is finished. OK, so let's move on and take a look at why titrations are used. Titrations are used between an acid and a base because they help us to pinpoint the end point of that reaction, okay? Now, for an acid and a base reaction, the end point is the point of neutralization. It's when the concentration of H plus is equal to the concentration of OH minus. Now, in chemistry, when we're talking about concentration, we use square brackets, in case you think I'm not doing round brackets. Square brackets mean concentration in moles per liter. So when you have the same number of H plus and OH minus ions in this conical flask down here, then you will have the point of neutralization because once they're equal, then we've reached what we call the pH of seven. OK, so we're looking for this point of what we call neutrality. And in order to find that, what we do is we add one solution to another. Now, normally the problem is that one solution is colorless and two solution is colorless. OK, so you're titrating something colorless against colorless and therefore we've got no idea visually as to where the end point is. Keep in mind when you're titrating an acid versus a base, the base normally goes down here. So now you'll have a pH of greater than seven. The acid normally goes up here where you'll have a pH of less than seven. OK, and what happens is as you add the acid into the base, the pH begins to drop and it begins to move downwards until it hits seven. And when it hits seven, that's the point at which we want to stop the titration and work out the volume of acid that was used to bring about neutralization. So therefore, in the conical flask, not only do we have the base, but we must also have what's called an indicator. Now, think about what an indicator does on a car. An indicator on a car tells you to go on left and right. An indicator will have two colors. It'll be one color in a basic solution and then it will be a second color in an acidic solution. So that when we hit the point of neutralization and go a tiny bit beyond, we're going to get a color change in the conical flask. And that color change is the sign to us. It's the visual clue that neutralization has been reached. And that's when we stop the titration. But more about that as we move on. OK. Therefore, if you're, as I said already, if your acid and base react in a ratio of one is to one, that formula is perfect. That will give me the number of moles of base. And this here will help me to find the number of moles of acid. Keep in mind, one of these will be an unknown. 
usually always the molarity of either the acid or the base. So it's usually M1 or M2 that is the X factor, if you want to put it that way. Okay, so one of these will be, one of these will have the X factor associated with it, or what we call the unknown. Okay. So the glassware, now there's quite a bit of glassware involved here. Normally when you're setting up for a titration, you have to go around the lab and you've got to find your burette and your pipette and your conical flask and your pipette filler and your beakers and your graduate cylinders and your filter funnels and so on. But why do we need all those pieces? Each piece of equipment has a very definite function, okay? And also, each piece has a different level of accuracy, which is important. The ones that have the greatest accuracy are your burette and your pipette. The ones that have a middling accuracy would be things like your graduated cylinder. And the ones with the least accuracy would be beakers and conical flasks. Okay, So because the beaker and the conical flask are the least accurate, they are the ones that we will never use to measure out liquids. We basically use them to approximate how much of a volume we have or just to hold liquids. So they wouldn't be used in measuring accurately. They're very, very inaccurate. They're only approximate. So we use them as approximate holding vessels. So the four most important pieces are one, two, three, and four, as shown here. Now, if I was to ask you which is which at the moment, you might get three out of four. You might recognise that's my graduated cylinder. You might recognise, oh yeah, that's the burette. Some of you may recognise or remember that this is the pipette. And then very few of you would have seen this before. This is called the volumetric flask. Okay, And I'm going to take each one of these in detail explain how we use them, explain why we use them, and then bring them all back together again and show you how we set up for a titration. So the volumetric flask, this one here, is used for making solutions. Now, if you take a look down this volumetric flask, you'll notice there's only one mark on the neck, okay? And that mark is the mark that you have to fill the liquid to in order to make sure that you have the correct solution, okay? More about that later. Notice on your pipette, Again, on your pipette, all the way up the neck, there's only one mark, okay? And again, you've got to bring the liquid up to that mark in order to make sure that you have exactly 25 centimeters cubed. So there are pipettes of various different sizes. The one that we always use in the lab is 25. So you will know when you've got 25 centimeters, when you're able to pull the liquid up here to that particular mark, okay? The burette, on the other hand, has a scale. So this is the only piece of glassware that we will use in a titration that has an accurate scale. And it goes from zero at the top to 50 at the bottom. It seems to have an inverted scale. Now the reason for that is because this measures the volume of discharged reagent. Okay, so in other words, we're measuring what's leaving the burette into the conical flask. So in other words, you're going to again fill your liquid to zero and then when you open this tap here, it'll begin to drop. And as it begins to drop, you're able to measure how much liquid you have lost out of your burette. Hence, how much liquid you've added to your conical flask. And lastly then, your graduated cylinder. Now, they are not for accuracy. They are for approximation, but they're far more approximate than beakers would be. So we would kind of lump them in here as an instrument that is a good way of approximating a volume of a certain liquid. They're not accurate, they're approximate. Okay. So the three pieces of glassware that are highly accurate are the volumetric flask, the VF, this one here, the pipette, and this one here, the burette. The burette, as we said already, is used for measuring reactant volume. So you fill it, open the tap and allow it in. So that's why you've got zero at the top. And finally, then you've got your graduated cylinder, which again is for measuring volume, okay? But we'd say that it's not accurate, it's an approximation. That's the key thing about the graduated cylinder as opposed to the burette. So let's take them one at a time. Let's start with the volumetric flask. Now, these flasks are used to accurately make a homogeneous standard solution. Now, I hope you understand what those three words mean. A homogeneous standard solution means that you have your solute and your solvent together. Homogeneous means mixed thoroughly together and standard means of known molarity. So the one thing about the solutions we make in the volumetric flask is number one, they are homogeneous, same concentration from top to bottom. Okay, and second, their molarity is known. That's the key thing. 
and I've put a video in there you can watch yourselves that will go through how to use the volumetric flask it's way out of the scope of this particular effort I'm making here so I'm going to let somebody else do it and they'll bring you through it okay so there it is now I want you to look at this little mark on the neck here okay because this is important when you're filling your volumetric flask the key thing you need to do first is to put in your solute now sometimes your solute might be a concentrated solution of something so you may have made up a little solution a beaker it's highly concentrated you might put that in here and then dilute it by adding water but the key thing is that as you add your solvent which is normally water you notice that the water begins to climb now we want to get the water as far as here okay and when we get to that line there is one thing that you have to ensure and that is the following watch Okay, when you get to here, the only way that you know that you have made exactly the correct volume of a solution is when this little U-shape, now water meets glass, it climbs up the edges, okay? So it always gives a U-shape. It's like you holding on to two things like that, that kind of a U-shape. If you're holding on to two walls or holding on to two um, swings or whatever, you've got this U-shape. We don't measure from the side. We always measure from the middle. So therefore, we've got to get the liquid to what we call sit on the line and that little u-shape is what we call the meniscus okay so you keep adding 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 then you get very slow and drop by drop by drop until you get this lovely u-shape sitting down like that on that line like that okay and there you can see it that little bit better now please do this at eye level don't be holding it up here. Don't be holding it down there. Do everything at eye level. That's the key thing about chemistry. So that when you notice that the U-shape is sitting on that line at eye level, then you have the perfect volume of your solution ready to go. So you've got to be very careful when you're using your volumetric flask. Okay, the second one is the pipette. Now again, a word about a pipette. Pipettes have been used time and time again. You don't know who used the pipette before you okay so there could be residue of chemicals in that pipette from a previous experiment so the key thing we have to do with a pipette before we do anything at all engaged with this titration is to rinse it and you rinse it out with what's called deionized water now that's water that has all the ions removed and we have that in the lab available to you in wash bottles okay but you rinse it through with the ionized water and then you take a little sample of the solution it's going to contain and you pour it in and you also wash it twice so the first time with water and the second time with the solution that it's going to contain and that's what i'm saying here you rinse your pipette twice the first time with deionized water the second time then with a little bit of the solution that it's going to contain and because that solution has been through the pipette into the waste beaker or down the sink you don't put it back into your stock solution in fact you never put anything into your stock solution once you make up your volumetric flask nothing goes into it you simply pour out of it okay so be careful with that so there's your pipette and again you'll notice that there's only one mark now how do we get the liquid up there well when we were in school we used to have to put our mouth over here and actually draw the liquid up by vacuum get a mouthful of chemicals it wasn't very pleasant now we protect you an awful lot better than they protected us we give you what's called a pipette filler okay and a pipette filler is an instrument that attaches to the top here i'll show it to you in a moment you attach this to the top and then you simply scroll the wheel with your thumb like that and what happens is it pulls the liquid upwards along this until you reach that mark and again please remember that when you have a mark on glassware you've got to make sure that the meniscus of the liquid sits on the mark watch there you go so you'll know when the meniscus is sitting on that mark if it's not then it doesn't have the correct volume now it's a difficult thing to try and master in the beginning but people get there over practice and time and time again so the pipette filler placed onto the top of the pipette itself placed into the stock solution which has been placed into a beaker first so you don't put it into the volumetric flask you pour some into a beaker and you take it out from there okay and again i have a video for you to watch there it is you can watch that yourselves see the pipette video um, and again listen carefully and make some notes of you need to in relation to how to wash your pipette and prepare your pipette and use your pipette now the one thing that people often wonder is okay when i have the liquid how do i take it out okay if this has sucked the liquid up how do i discharge it and there's a little button just here see that button there 
when you press that button it's like taking your finger off something it just lets the liquid out but there's two things to remember when you are discharging the liquid you've got to make glass to glass contact between the pipette and the side of the conical flask okay so a bit like a snooker cue there's the side of the conical flask there is your pipette you make contact and then you discharge by pressing the button at the side okay and then it simply goes down and it always leaves what appears to be a tiny drop at the end now you don't force it out you don't shake it because these are designed to deliver exactly what you need to work with 25 centimeters cubed if it says 25 centimeters cubed on the label then it's going to deliver it providing that you use it properly so 25 centimeters cubed here the way in which we do that glass to glass push the button allow it down under gravity and when it stops don't shake it in just take it out and leave it on the table okay so glass to glass contact and do not attempt to shake out any remaining drops as this will overcharge it'll put in too much of your reactant into your conical flask and it'll ruin your experiment so be very very careful on the discharge so you roll up you scroll the wheel to pull the liquid up get the meniscus onto the mark make glass to glass contact press the button allow it to discharge and when it has discharged under gravity by itself remove it and put it on the table okay the burette the same as the pipette again we don't know who's used this before us okay and because the pipette is such a long it's 50 centimeters in length longer actually it's about 60 70 centimeters in length we have to clamp these things now please be very careful because if you clamp too tightly it's going to smash all right so you've got to be careful that you clamp it tight enough not to move up and down but loose enough to move from side to side and that's usually the test if they can move from side to side but not up and down you've got the correct kind of uh, strength on those um, what would you call them those fingers of this clamp here to hold it in place but again you'll notice that it has to be washed somebody used it before you so you do the same thing as you did with the pipette you rinse it with the ionized water first and then you rinse it with the solution it's going to contain so you're cleaning your equipment getting them ready for what they're going to do okay that's the first thing so this apparatus again needs to be rinsed as we said already twice you rinse it with the solution with the deionized water and then with the solution it's going to contain and there is a rinsing video there that you can watch in relation to how to use your burette and all your glassware that goes through how to rinse all your glassware by the way now it's usually filled with the aid of a funnel and a glass rod there's your funnel now what we do is you put the funnel obviously in here okay like that but then you put a glass rod down the center and you pour the liquid onto the glass rod so that the glass rod will pull the liquid down through the filter funnel and into the burette okay that's normally so your burette will be here this will be resting here like that your burette will run down this way like so and then you'll have a glass rod there like this and the glass rod will simply take the liquid down through the center of the funnel and into your burette so the burette is clamped the filter funnel is placed in the top and then a glass rod directs the liquid down through the funnel into your burette. Now, there's two things we've got to be careful of. First of all, we have an area down here under the tap, which we call the reservoir. And when you're rinsing, you have to rinse the reservoir as well. OK, so it's no harm to put in the solution it's going to contain, open the tap and allow the reservoir to fill and then just discharge that little amount of solution out into a waste beaker and then down the sink if needs to be with copious amounts of water but make sure that the whole thing is rinsed through overfill the burette so you close your tap this tap moves so you close your tap so your tap will now be this way you close your tap and then you begin to fill but i would always suggest that as you're pouring the liquid in carefully overfill go up to about here first overfill your burette and then take a beaker with waste solution bring it underneath open the tap very very carefully and let this come down until it sits on the zero mark then close your tap and then you're ready to go okay and again there's a video for you there to watch on how to use your burette so a lot of videos to watch but i do want you to watch them because they are quite good and quite pedantic okay what about the graduate cylinder and the beaker why do i take these two together because they are instruments that only deliver approximate volumes they do not deliver accurate volumes okay now obviously the burette or sorry the, the burette the graduated cylinder is a little bit more accurate than a beaker would be but still it's a way of getting 
an approximate volume of a liquid. Okay, They're not accurate instruments whatsoever and don't ever treat them as accurate instruments. They're not. The piece of glassware, that's the graduated cylinder, is used, or these, both of them actually, are used for approximately measuring the volume of a given liquid. Volumes are read from the bottom of the meniscus as always. So for example, if you had something like this, like that, what would you have? Well, in that case there, you'd have 70 centimetres cubed because you're reading from the bottom. That's where your eye will be. Okay, so you're reading from the bottom all the time, bottom of the meniscus. Beakers are less accurate than graduated cylinders and so are also used to approximate. Now again, look, you've got a little bit of a difficulty. There's nothing. You've got 300, then 350, and then 400. What about 321? Can't do it with a beaker, so it's approximate. Never pipette directly from a stock solution. Now, stock solutions are held in your volumetric flask. And what I said to you already is, when you've made your solution, your homogeneous standard solution inside in your volumetric flask, nothing ever enters that flask again. So you take out a sample of your stock solution into a beaker and you pipette out of the beaker, but never out of the volumetric flask itself. So that's another use for the beaker that we have there. Beakers may also be used to simply hold waste liquids. So when you're filling up your burette and you overfill and you want to tap off some of it that's waste, Take a beaker, allow it in, throw it down the sink and rinse it when you're finished. And finally then, the conical flask. Now, what's the conical flask? The conical flask is nothing more than the site of reaction. This is where the chemistry is going to happen. Okay, It's going to happen in here. So the first thing we will do is we will take our pipette. We will fill it with the liquid that we need in order to place into the volume into the conical flask. We will then place the liquid under gravity into the conical flask and we will put the conical flask under the burette with a white tile underneath it so we can see the colour changes and we will run our titrations. The conical flask only has one main function, to hold the reactants during a titration. And don't forget the titration is the neutralisation reaction that we're undergoing. Okay, that's its only, that's its main function. It is only rinsed with deionized water. Now, the burette rinsed twice, the pipette rinsed twice, the conical flask once only. You never wash the conical flask with the solution it's going to contain because then you've got some solution in there that's going to be part of your reaction that we don't want to be part of the reaction. So burette wash twice, pipette wash twice, conical flask only once with copious amounts of deionized water. What about its shape? There's three benefits to its shape and I think first of all you can see what that is. First of all, the base is very wide, okay? And because the base is wide, it's not going to fall over very easily. It takes quite a belt to knock these things over. They're very, very stable, okay? Secondly, when you're allowing your liquid in, there's going to be splashes. Now, normally those splashes are going to hit the sides and trickle back down into reaction again. So the sloping sides prevent splashes from escaping. And thirdly, because of its shape, it is perfectly designed to swirl the contents, which we do doing it during a titration. So the three things are, it prevents the splashes leaving the system when you're adding in your reactant from the burette. Number two, its wide base makes it difficult to knock over. And number three, the contents will stay in this flask when you're swirling. Now, if you took a beaker and you swirl something, it's going to come out the top, okay? Because the walls are like that, so it'll just come out the top. Conical flask, no. You swirl stuff in the conical flask, it'll climb the walls to a certain amount and it'll come back down again. Hence the reason why the sloped walls are extremely important. The contents of the pipette are discharged into it under gravity. And I'll show you this in a moment. Using glass to glass contact. So in other words, you bring your pipette down here like this. There it is, like so. Okay. And the pipette makes contact with the glass and it allows the solution down the side like that. So that's what you do with your pipette. Glass to glass contact, press the button, allow it in under gravity and once it stops flowing that's your 25 centimeters added in usually it's placed on top of a white tile so you'll normally see something like this underneath it a white tile and the reason for the white tile is so that if there is going to be a color change i'm going to be able to see it very very well so the white tile underneath the conical flask is an aid to me being able to see the color change when we hit that point of neutralization and we have to stop the burette from discharging any more of its contents. So how do I bring them all together? There they go. There's a the titration. Now, 
the first thing I want to do, I'm going to go over this in stages. There's stage number one, there's stage number two. There's only two stages to a titration, okay? Stage number one is taking what we call your standard solution and putting it into a beaker. And from the beaker, you suck up the required volume, normally 25 centimeters cubed, using your pipette filler, okay? You bring it up until it sits on the mark. The little meniscus will tell you when you're in the right place. And then, when you have the correct amount, you take your pip out, pipette out at an angle, you make glass to glass contact. You can remove the pipette filler if you want, or you can simply press the button. That's totally up to yourselves. You can take it off and allow the liquid to simply fall down under gravity into your conical flask. Okay, so that's the first thing. Standard solution. You pour some into a beaker. You then take from the beaker up by your pipette the required volume. You then discharge it into the conical flask using glass to glass contact and using only gravity to pull it out, nothing else. Okay, so when your conical flask is ready, where does it go? It goes under the burette on the white tile. Okay, now how do I sort out my burette? Well, again, you rinse the burette twice, once with the ionized water, once with the solution it's going to contain. You then make sure that if you're pouring this in, that you're rinsing it, I should say, that you keep the tap open. Just allow a little bit of waste out, but make sure the reservoir is washed as well. When you are ready to fill your burette, you turn the tap this way, okay? So you turn it 90 degrees to the burette, and then, using your filter funnel and your glass rod, you pour the liquid onto the glass rod, which will direct it right down into the burette. Keep on going, 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 but overfill. I'll explain why in a moment. Overfill your burette, okay? Then take away the filter funnel, take away the glass rod, take away the beaker, take everything away. Then open the tap and allow the liquid then to fall down until it sits on that zero mark, okay? When your burette is ready to go, you clamp it, like we have here. You put the conical flask underneath on a white tile. And then when you're ready to go, you can open and allow this liquid in to do the job. Now you'll have an indicator in here as well. But the last thing I want to tell you is this, that whilst you are doing the titration, every 30 seconds, maybe 45 seconds, stop the titration, take a bottle of deionized water, okay, and rinse down the sides of the conical flask. Don't be afraid to use deionized water to rinse, to get all the chemicals down into the bottom where they'll react well. So last time, standard solution into a beaker. A pre-rinsed pipette and a pipette filler are used to take the reagent up to the required mark and get the meniscus sitting on that mark. You discharge reagent one into a conical flask by glass to glass contact under the force of gravity. That is your conical flask ready to go. Now, your burette, rinse it twice. Water, the ionized water, solution is going to contain. Rinse a little bit through, make sure the reservoir is rinsed as well. Close the tap and then overfill using your contents of reagent two, your glass rod, and your filter funnel, okay? Overfill, go over the zero mark, take away the glass rod, the filter funnel, and the beaker, because if you leave the filter funnel in, by the way, drops could fall in, and it will keep affecting your volume. So take everything away from the top, then open the tap and allow the meniscus to come down and sit perfectly on the line, what we call zero. There's a zero line in all of these, okay? So let it come down until it sits on that in that normal U shape. Then you're ready to go. Put your conical flask under your burette, add your indicator, which we normally add in, in as a few drops. And then open the tap and keep watching, yeah? Well, you watch down here in the beginning because this is where chemistry happens. But when you're taking the reading, you take the reading at eye level always. Always at eye level as to where the volume of reagent is when the reaction has reached a point of neutralization. And the final thing I will say to you is, please, 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 rinse, 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 rinse every 45 seconds. Rinse the sides well, get all the chemicals down into the bottom so they can react and be used up in this uh, journey towards neutralization. Now, just to bring you through all that, there's a video here also I want you to use. I want you to watch that video because it brings you through the entire titration. You may have to watch these videos three, four, five, six, seven times really to get a hang of how to treat this equipment because it is an accurate process and accuracy needs attention to detail. So be very, very careful. We don't ever do a titration slipshod. We have to be very careful. We've got to be attentive to detail. We've got to be pedantic in the way we do things and we've got to be safe 
So we protect our eyes with goggles and so on. We put on a lab coat if we have one, or the gloves on in order to protect our skin from the chemicals. But you've got to protect yourself as well. So having looked at all those videos, having listened to me for the last number of minutes and so on, before we move into the calculations of these things, I'm going to bring you through a little revision exercise here, which I'm going to ask you to do now. A to M, just to bring you through the stages of why we might do certain things on the journey towards the point of neutralization in a titration.